Good morning, everyone. My name is Yvonne, and I'd like to welcome you to the Sunday service. Um, I hope you've had a great week. This week, we'll continue again looking at the series that uh, we recently started, um, which is called Into the Unknown and Following Jesus in an Uncertain World. Um, this week, Pastor Stewart will be looking at the subject of uh, called to learn. But before I hand you over to him and before the service starts, I would like to open in a word of prayer, if that's okay. Let's pray. Father, we want to say thank you for this great opportunity that we have to just gather in front of our screens or to listen to this in a video or or, or, or CD form or whichever way we're listening to this message, whether it's uh, via the internet. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to be able to sit down, to listen to your word, to learn what you have to say to us, to learn to be better people. Father, I thank you for each and every person that's listening out there. I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be open to hear what you have to say, that our minds are ready to receive Father, we pray and we ask, Lord, that your words would transform us. Your words would, yeah, teach us more about your kingdom. That truly, as we are in an uncertain world, uh, in uncertain times like this, that we would see Jesus in everything that we do. That we would have the strength to be able to, yeah, to, to conquer the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And so, Lord, we pray and we ask, Lord, that you'll continue to strengthen us by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and welcome to our morning service. Thank you, Yvonne, for that welcome. Psalm 103. If you would like to read along as the words on the screen, feel free to do so. But equally, just allow the words that, as I read them, to minister to you. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. We're going to sing our opening hymn, Praise my soul, the King of heaven. And uh, feel free to join in as the music is played, or allow again the words to minister to you as, they, uh, as it's sung on this video. Thy tribute bring ransom. 
for our local churches, we're going to pray for our Baptist family, and this week as part of our prayer call, we're praying for the church at Bilderston Baptist Church in Suffolk, the longest and the oldest Baptist church in Suffolk. They are currently have a minister who's part-time, who is due to retire earlier this year in April, but has agreed to stay on until uh, the end of this pandemic, uh, but they will then be going through a process of seeking God for the next person, the next part of their story. They're uh, going to have some time between uh, ministers, but they're just really asking that God would lead them at this time. So they're asking us to do that, pray for them through this time. They're not able to meet on Zoom like we are on Sundays. They're, they're doing stuff in a different way in a different way, and with a different format to, to us here at Barnwell. But we're going to pray for the church at Bilderston, uh, for their pastor, Jim, uh, and yeah, lift them to God and ask that he would guide them through this time and particularly they seek to serve in that village with their outreach initiatives, and that will see people come to know our Lord and Saviour. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and to worship you. We thank you that uh, we, we know that you are with us, even though we are physically not together. Thank you that by your Spirit you are uh, present with each person watching this video. We thank you, Father God, for... Uh, your presence with us, and we thank you for your guidance for us as a church at this time. We pray that you continue to lead us and guide us in our relationships with others around us, particularly our local churches here in Abbey, for the church at Fenditon Parish, for St. Vincent de Paul at Christ Redeemer at City Church and Christ Church as we serve in this community together. Lord, continue to bless our relationships, we ask, one with another. We too pray, Father God, also for our Baptist family. We Thank you for our regional team of Beth and Nick and Graham and Haley, And we seek your blessing upon them and your protection upon them. And we do pray for the church of Bilderston this week. We pray for Jim, their minister. We pray that as they meet today in different ways, as they will be looking at different uh, things of what we're looking at in a different format to what we're looking at, we thank you that nonetheless you are the same. And we pray that you would be present with them, speaking into their lives, into their context, into their situation. And you would guide them <coughs> as they seek to be effective as your men and women and church in that community. Guide and lead them, we pray. And so we thank you uh, for your presence with them. We thank you for our relationship one with another uh, in this 
in his area. Lord, we do indeed thank you for our relationships with the local Baptist churches in Cambridge, for all that you're doing with us here. Continue, Father God, to teach us, we pray, what it looks like and what it means for us to be and to dwell in unity one with another. So in our service, Lord, what guide us, lead us, we pray, as we worship you and as we give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just got a few notices as usual, so we uh, will be having our virtual coffee time at 12 o'clock if you're able to join us. Again, if you can't access that, then get in touch with myself or Steve and we'll try and get you into that. We meet tomorrow morning to pray again at 9.30 and those who are regularly part of that will be invited if you would like to be and haven't been thus far. Again, get in touch and we can add you to that invitation. Small groups will be meeting again this week on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, again, if you are not part of those groups and want to be, get in touch and we could get you the details for that. On Tuesday this week, we're going to start a series of questions of life in 2020 lockdown. It's really aimed at those who aren't part of our church community at the moment, really just to come on, on a platform and just to talk uh, together and discuss together the questions that people have. Um, and so, so if you know people that would like to come onto that, then please pass the link on. Information is on our website. It is on uh, a Facebook page on our Instagram post, uh, page too, so do check that out. If you can't find all that information, uh, then get in touch and we can get that to you. And then Monday week, we're going to meet again to pray corporately um, and gather, gather together uh, to, to pray for our community, to pray for our church, to, for God to lead us and to guide us at this time. There's lots going on around the building, lots going on around the, the area, and we really need just to trust God that he would guide us at this time. So that's uh, next Monday, Monday week. God's love is amazing, and we're going to celebrate that as we sing together. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Hallelujah, your love makes me sing. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain from beneath my feet Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me When I am surrounded, your love carries me Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah Your love makes me sing Feel it rising, all the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through. I can feel this God song rising up in me. continue with our lessons from lockdown this week and we're going to hear from Jane. So over to you Steve. Well good morning Jane, thank you very much for agreeing to do this interview. Uh, I look forward to hearing what, what you've got to say. So the first question is um, lockdown, how has it been for you? What have you been doing during this uh, unusual time? Shortly after I retired in 2017, I began serving in Barnwell's Cafe on Mondays, getting alongside people who came along. When it was closed on 16th of March, I began to think and pray about what ways I could continue to support and befriend people 
in the community in the church. As there were no flowers to share from the church services, I've been buying flowers and fruit every Monday and delivering to people who need a bit of cheering up or thanking and leaving or leaving them with Stuart um, to take to people he knew in the community. Um, um, I've also turned up with a variety of other things um, which have become apparent as to be helpful to them. I'm in contact by phone too, and I've been linked up with those who've been in touch with Stuart um, and would appreciate friendship and support. Sometimes a card is better, and so that's been too, done too. Um, I take CDs made um, from the Sunday services to three uh, different places uh, for those who haven't got the equipment for online listening. Um, I do follow all the rules and take care to spread kindness and not the virus. At home, I'm keeping in touch with my girls' brigade families in Haverhill and GB leaders in my five groups across our district area. Okay, well, that sounds like you're still pretty busy, which is, uh, which is good. And I'm sure all that's very much appreciated. Uh, well, I know that it is. And um, along with the business, do you think you've been learning anything? Like, you know, has God been teaching you anything specific that you'd like to share? Oh, yes, um, always. Um, early on in the shutdown, uh, when shopping about the place, like uh, everyone, um, we found the shelves empty of items we needed. Um, and Jeff, my husband, reminded me of the lessons we'd learnt years ago. The Lord will provide. Um, when we needed painkillers um, or something else, it would be there at the right time. And then had to trust God by taking just enough uh, and making sure we left some for others. I've also been able to supply others' needs. Uh, special um, tales about toilet rolls are also available. I continue to be aware of failing in the opportunities God gives me, um, but to pray for forgiveness, uh, strength, and all I need from him to continue to share his love and good news about him. Since retiring, I've continually learning to be available for God to use me to be alongside people at challenging times and trust him that everything else will be okay. Okay, thank you. And do you think there are there are lessons that are applicable to the to us as a as a church community, slightly more you know, wider than just lessons for you, lessons for all of us? Barmore Baptist Church is currently serving the community as a food hub um, run by Abbey People. Stuart has given much time to be there um, and available on the phone and by email. As he um, follows those up with visits and reaches out to those needing physical help, um, support or friendship, we as a church must consider how we meet those needs. Um, pray for um, other people to come and work alongside us and ask God to challenge our own hearts um, as to how we can serve. We need to continue to build on our, the way we have been keeping in contact with each other so that in the future we ensure everyone is included in our church family life together as we and as we grow. At lunchtime, I've been catching up with reading magazines um, from the charities that we support, two of which are concerned with nature. It's reminded me our world has been focused on actively working on the big climate fight back. It could take 1.5 billion trees for the UK to hit its carbon net zero by 2050. Let us do our bit, include tree planting in our ideas for the future God has planned for us as our church, our homes and community. And thanks to Elizabeth and Ken for working hard to give us a lovely church garden on in very difficult soil. It's lovely.
Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Jane. And uh, it's good to hear from you. And we really want to encourage anyone else who would like to be part of that and have something to share, then to get in touch with us. And we'd love the opportunity to hear from you uh, in a future lessons from lockdown. Uh, so do get in touch with Steve or myself and we could uh, point you in the direction of, of that and how to get involved in that. We're going to come to a time of prayer now. We're going to pray for our nation. We're going to pray for our community. We're going to pray uh, for this Father's Day. Um, it's unusual, but uh, we're going to come to God and, and pray for those in our community that are struggling today because their father's absent, because of history with their father, which may not, have been, may not be good. Um, fathers that they can't see today because of, of the lockdown. And uh, so we're going to come to God in prayer and to pray for that. We're also going to rec recognize too the international initiative and campaigning around Black Lives Matters and this whole challenge around racial inequality that there is in our world. Um, and we need to kind of just seek that God will give, give wisdom and guide uh, those in authority at this time, but also help us to examine our own hearts and see if there's any wrong way within us to take the words of the, the psalmist David um, to allow ourselves to be examined uh, by God. So let's pray, shall we? Father God, thank you that we can come to you on this Father's Day, the great Father in heaven who loves us, who cherishes us, who blesses us. And as Jesus himself said, you know, if we love our kids and we give our kids the best thing, how much more will our Father in heaven give us good gifts, will, will bless us? You are so much greater than any earthly father. You are so much better and bigger and more loving and more generous than anything that we would find on this earth. And we thank you for that. Thank you that it's to you that we now come in prayer. But we also recognize, Father God, that for some people in our world today and some people who will be watching this video, there is real pain over this day. It may be the first day when the first Father's Day without their father. There may be no opportunity to be together as normally would happen. For some people, they don't have a good relationship with their father or there is bad history and bad uh, uh, bad news associated with their fathers and it causes them pain and angst well we don't seek to minimize any of that we want to acknowledge that there is real pain and real heartache and we, but we, Father God, we want to pray that by your Holy Spirit you would come and be present in those families in those communities in those homes where there is real struggles today we pray that your peace would come that you would indeed be very real and very present. We pray for our nation at this time of continued uncertainty and continued turmoil. We pray for our world, for our world leaders, for those in authority, for those who are seeking to, uh, to, to test and, uh, and process what's going on in the scientific world. For those who are on the front lines, serving and caring. Father God, we pray that you would indeed be really uh, active and present in our communities. We pray for your church that it would continue to rise up and stand tall and stand proud. And point people to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. But also to do that in a way which is humble and uh, servant-hearted. Father God, lead us and guide us, we pray. We thank you for what we're able to do here in Barnwell. And we pray for this, uh, these, these opportunities on these Tuesday evenings to come together. We pray, Father, that people have the courage and the confidence to, to join us. Uh, and just to, to articulate the questions that they have, to express their views in a way which is, you know, without threat of, uh, of being shut down. We pray, Father God, that you would indeed be present in those times as people uh, join us. And Father, we pray too for our world at this time where the racial inequality is, is high on the agenda. It's, it's in our public uh, view all of the time. We're hearing about it in different ways. Father, we pray against finger pointing. We pray against 
um, judge, a judgmental attitude. Lord, help us, as David says, first to examine our own hearts, to allow you to search us, to see if there's any wrong way in us, to see what, where we need to change, where we need to be different. For us as a church community, for us here at Barnwell, Lord, guide us and lead us, we pray, that we may genuinely be a people of God who care for each and every individual. Lord, guide and lead us, we pray. We pray that you would uh, protect um, our nation from uh, finger-pointing and from accusation, from people abusing what's going on to pursue their own agenda. We pray that uh, violence would cease and dialogue would increase, a level of understanding amongst one another, an acceptance of different views. But Father God, we pray that you would indeed pour your spirit of peace and, uh, and guide us as a nation, as a world, through this season, we pray. And so, Father God, we thank you that we can come to you, our Father who is in heaven. We offer our prayers in and through Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing another song. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. Forever he is faithful. Let's remind ourselves of that faithfulness as we sing this together. spoke a couple of weeks ago about perspective and the fact that the closer you are to something, the harder it is often to see the bigger picture. When you're in the detail, when you're in the midst of that moment, stepping back a little bit and looking at the bigger picture is a bit of a challenge. As I was reflecting on that, I guess that um, a bit of self-evaluation, I guess I was, I was reflecting on my own strengths and weaknesses. And I guess one of my strengths and one of my gifts is that ability to both keep that vision and that perspective, that bigger picture, but also not to lose the detail. 
And so whether that's within Abbey people or within the church, I, I have that ability to be able to, to hold those two things in tension. But what that means is that when it comes to issues like this, it doesn't faze me about the fact that there's uncertainty. It doesn't worry me too much about that I don't know what tomorrow is going to happen. I don't, it doesn't worry me that I don't know what is going to happen in September. And I can react quite quickly and I can respond quite quickly. Um, and it doesn't bother me too much. And that's a real strength, but I also recognize that that also can mean that I don't have empathy for those who are really struggling at this time. And I recognize that for some people, this is a really difficult time. And it's a really, uh, really t- it's a real time of real heartache and real pain. And that uncertainty is causing ang- anxiety and fear. And we go back to what we looked at a few weeks ago with th- that kind of renewing of our mind, that, that's the battle for our minds. But as we go into this, look, continuing our series, looking at leading, following Jesus into the unknown, I want to articulate that, you know, for me, in terms of my particular gifts, gifts and strengths, some of these issues are not as perhaps as, as pertinent as they are to others. We all need to listen to God. We all need to learn from God. But our characters mean that we respond differently. Our gifts mean we respond differently. And therefore, we need to kind of allow God, by his spirit, to take his word and apply it to our lives so that we can hear from him and respond to him. That we can allow him to shape us. And today, we're looking at this this theme of um, going into the unknown, but that idea of continuing to learn from God. It's been 14 weeks of lockdown. We started lockdown. The first Sunday of lockdown was Mothering Sunday, Mother's Day. And here we are on Father's Day, 14 weeks later, still no clearer really what tomorrow is going to bring, how this is going to pan out, and still no clearer of how much longer this is going on for. And I guess as I was reflecting on that, I was thinking back, obviously this week we've heard of the passing of Dame Vera Lynn, and I was reflecting back on, I guess, the last biggest uh, thing like this that that hit the UK, which was the Second World War, and those people who were alive in 1939, and how 13, 14, 15 weeks into that period of time, they had no idea how long that war was going to last, no idea that they were in it for six long years. And ultimately, in the, in, the, in the light of those six years, those 13 weeks were not that great a period of time. We need to keep that sense of perspective, but also need to recognize that in the detail and in the day-to-day, we also need to learn and we need to put our trust in Jesus and guide, as he guides us through. So I just want to recap on the last couple of weeks before we get going with today's material. So Jesus had started his earthly ministry. He's very aware as he starts that, that he has just a few years before he will face the cross. He knew that he was here to die. He knew why he'd been sent to this earth. He knew the path that lay before him. He also knew that if everything went as planned, he was going to return to the Father. And at that time, the Holy Spirit would be sent and the chosen few that were following him at that point would be given the task of taking this message to the world. Just a comment on that phrase I said there, if everything went as planned. I think it's a significant comment because you know, we can often assume that it just happened because it happened. There wasn't an inevitability about what happened. Absolutely, for sure, Jesus knew why he had come. Jesus knew that he had come to this earth to, to, to take that place on the cross of sacrifice, to make a way for us to be reconciled to God. But it wasn't inevitable because at each point on his journey, Jesus had a choice to make. That sacrifice could only have happened and only would have worked as it has if Jesus was 
completely clean and completely pure and without sin. But he was tempted all the way through his life. And at each temptation, he had a choice. Did he obey or did he not? Did he follow or did he choose to do what the, temptation was, the tempter was saying? At various points in his earthly ministry, there were moments where he had to choose. He could have walked away. He could have done things differently. And ultimately, that moment where we know well, if Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was confronted with the agony of the cross before him and he wept and was sweating blots, bloods of, uh, drops of blood. And he says, yeah, not my will, but yours be done. That ultimate act of obedience and surrender. Jesus had choices to make, but at every point in that moment, uh, in, the, in, that, in his life, at every point along that, that journey, at every moment <clears throat> when he was faced with that choice, Jesus chose obedience. So there wasn't an, inevit an inevitability about it. Jesus knew that that was the way he was going, that knew what was before him, but he had to choose to follow that path. He knew that three years would, would pass and he was to gather these men around him who would be entrusted with this mission. And so last week we looked at how he started to do that. He started to gather these men, this group of people, and out of that group he prayed to God, his father, and said, okay, God, who are the 12? And these 12 were given the task of being apostles, of being messengers. And it's to these people he gave the first task, but he also knew that post-Pentecost, that task was going to be given to all those who followed him, who were to be called his witnesses and his ambassadors. So here we have Jesus choosing 12, 12 young men out of this much larger group. Some we know about, as we said last Sunday, some we don't know much about. And yet these were all ones who Jesus now needed to focus his attention on. At a recent uh, Cambridge Baptist Ministers Gathering, we were talking and reflecting on the journey around, particularly around chaplaincy. And uh, one of the ministers was quoting and talking about uh, the principal at Spurgeon's College, sharing his experience. And he was comparing the Christian journey into ministry with that of, say, the humanist uh, movement. And saying that there isn't a comparable. That in Christian ministry, you have to do three years at a theological college and then another three years of curacy or another three years of uh, probation or of training on the job. So by the time you get to that end of the process, whether you know in the in the Christian tradition it, you've been in it for six years, and in the humanist tradition there isn't that experience. He was saying that in the kind of particularly some of the chaplaincy uh, work that happens, that counts for an awful lot. The what they're getting as as people of ministers are people who have been trained on the job, six years. Jesus had three years with his 12. And those three years, he, in those three years, he did both the theological and he did the practical. And those both were combined in that three-year period of walking and living with Jesus. We recognize that we need, as Christian ministers, that training. We need that input. And for Jesus, is 12 that is also true. And so we come today to the start of that three-year training program. Let's pick up the story again. We'll go where we were last Sunday in Luke chapter 6. We'll start with the passage we read last week and then we'll follow it on to the next few verses as well. <clears throat> this is Luke chapter 6. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who later became a traitor. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon. 
who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, We need to be lifelong learners. You know those people who we come across in our lives, don't we, who have always been where we've been and they've got the T-shirt to say they've done it bigger and better than we have. What we've done, they've done it at a, a whole new level. Whatever our experience, they trump that because theirs is more dangerous, more, big, more elaborate. And we come across those people in our daily lives, in our work lives sometimes. And you just can't compete with them. You just can't have a conversation with them because whatever you share, they've always got a response to come back with. One of the things I often note about those people is that there's sometimes a willingness, an unwillingness to learn, to listen, to reflect. They're very happy to talk about their experiences, very happy to share what they have done. But taking time to pause and to reflect and to learn means that that doesn't often happen to the same extent. Many of us would have heard and seen comments over these last few weeks about uh, the, the racist stuff, inequality that's happening and, all the, and the Black Lives Movement campaign and, and initiative. And particularly in the UK, how that issue has related to statues and monuments and our history as a nation. I recently read this quote, and I'm just putting it up there, not to make a political statement, but I think it teaches us something, and I think we need to learn what this, you know, from this statement. Um, I don't know who said it. I don't know who, who I'm quoting here, but I do think there's something of value for us to reflect on here. History is not there for you to like or dislike. It is there for you to learn from it. And if it offends you, even better because you're then you are less likely to repeat it. It's not yours to erase. It belongs to all of us. It's been fascinating, isn't it, Been to watch how our nation has responded to our history and how we want to try, almost airbrush some of that out. But others would say we're trying to correct what has been badly presented in the first place. I don't want to get drawn into that, but what I want to do is take us back to the nation of Israel, to the book of Judges. And in the book of Judges, we find the nation of Israel in this downward spiral where they kind of turn their backs on God. God sends in some, uh, an army to judge them. They turn back to God and cry out to God for, for salvation, and, and he sends a savior, a judge, to save them. And they then enjoy a period of, of, of prosperity. But then they forget again God. They turn their back on God and they go round that cycle again. And it happens time and time again through the book of Judges. We see this cycle, this, this downward spiral of, of, of uh, turning their backs upon God. You see, what the nation of Israel didn't do, they didn't learn from their history. They didn't stop and take stock of what was going on. And you read through the book of the books of the Old Testament, the history books of one kings and two kings and one chronicles and two chronicles, and you see the patterns uh, coming back time and time again. Not learning from the mistakes of the past. You know, and as human beings, it, one of the things that's very difficult for us to do at times is to, is to press the pause button, to take stock and to look back and to learn. Life feels like it's endless. But somehow, sometime, we need to allow ourselves to reflect and to learn from the past. As followers of Jesus, we need to be committed to be lifelong learners, constantly taking that time to reflect, to pray, to listen, to discuss, to ask the questions. Not to assume that we have all the answers, not to assume that we know it all, but to learn about our, our Lord and Saviour Jesus, but to learn also about ourselves, about what happens for us. Right at the start of this 
journey that these disciples are on. And they had no idea where they were going. They had no idea that in three years' time Jesus was going was to be killed and that he was going to be buried, that he'd come back to life, that he'd go back to heaven. They had absolutely no idea that they would be the ones who would be responsible for the greatest human movement of all time. They were stepping completely into the unknown. And yet they began that journey as lifelong learners. All of them except one. And there we have the fallout. So there was one of the twelve that didn't learn. We have in the twelve a tax collector, Matthew. And we have Simon who is a zealot. Zealots were wanting to get rid of the Romans. These would have been enemies. And yet at no point in the gospel records do we ever read of these two falling out. At no point does Jesus have to pull these two aside and say to them, come on guys, enough. He does it with others, but not these two. And I suspect the reason for that is that when they chose to follow Jesus, they chose to allow him to shape their thoughts, their thinking, their responses, their attitudes, their behaviours. They gave themselves and committed themselves to learn of him and to learn of themselves, to recognise their own weaknesses, to learn to love one another. But one disciple didn't learn, and that is Judas Iscariot. I would suggest that he learned what God's way was. He learned about Jesus as Jesus taught him. But he didn't learn about his own weaknesses and about his own failings. And he didn't certainly learn to love others more than himself. Judas, as we read in John chapter 12, was very selfish and dishonest. Let's read what it says. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. This is in response to someone pouring on the, wanting to anoint Jesus with expensive uh, perfume. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he, was cared, because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus had the measure of him. In John chapter 6, Jesus already said to Judas, you are evil. He knew that this was one of those men in his team who was a rotten apple. This is one of those moments, I think, where Jesus had to choose to obey his father. Did Jesus choose Judas because he wanted Judas as part of his team? Or did he choose Judas because when he prayed before he chose the twelve, his father in heaven who knew Judas, said, you need to have him on your team because he's the one who ultimately is going to betray you. He is the one who's going to unlock that future journey that you're going to be on. I suspect that with everything within Jesus, would have wanted to say to Judas, sorry. But in obedience, he allowed Judas Judas to be with him. He allowed him to journey with him. He allowed him to have the purse strings. He allowed him to, as it were, make his own bed. But Judas did not learn. Judas was not reflecting. Judas was not listening. He thought he was okay. He was arrogant enough to assume that he was beyond that need to, to change. And he got embroiled and that selfishness kind of seeps away. But I do think he learned of God because I think that's what convicted him right at the end. He recognized where he'd made that mistake. But if we're not careful, in our journeys we can become hard and stubborn and proud and selfish. 
and we looked at our own, own interests first before we looked at the interests of other people. And when that happens, we become, in the church community, in God's people, a bad influence. We become the rotten apple in the pack. That's what happens when we don't commit ourselves to be lifelong learners, to commit ourselves to saying, do you know what, I haven't got all the answers. I need to continue to learn. I need to continue to seek God, to allow him to shape who I am and what I am. But let's also recognize in that moment, when we make that choice, we are surrendering to the greatest teacher of all time. We're not just listening to anybody. We're not just following anybody. We are following the greatest. And what a privilege that is. Let's acknowledge, as Peter did, as he says these words recorded in John. Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Whom, who else should we listen to? You have the words of eternal life. So if you're going to listen to anybody's words, why wouldn't we want to listen to your words? We've come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. That recognition that here is the greatest. Here is the one who is not trumped by anybody. Nobody else even comes close. Who else should we go to? Who else should we follow? Who else should we listen to? Jesus looked at his disciples and said. He looked at his disciples and he said. And in John, in Luke chapter 6 and verse 20, where, hap- where that, that's, that phrase is used, we then find ourselves into some of the teaching of Jesus, which has become known it's sometimes in, in Matthew's part of the the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus looked at his disciples, these men that had chosen to follow him, who had chosen to become lifelong learners, and he looked at them and he taught them. John records, right at the end of his Gospel, do you know what? We've only written just a little bit. There's so much more that could be written that they're not enough. The world wouldn't be enough to hold the books that would be written. That's the, the beauty of what Jesus does. But he, what we have in our, in our Bibles is what we need to learn of him. As we acknowledge right at the start, none of us knows what day tomorrow will be. None of us knows how this pandemic is going to end. None of us knows what's going to happen in a few months' time, in a year or two's time. We just have no idea. It is completely going into the unknown. None of us have ever been here before, as has been heard many times from our politicians and leaders. None of us have ever been through this before. We have no clue, really, what is happening. And we are very much feeling our way each step of the way. That's frustrating and it's difficult and it's unsettling. That uncertainty does really affect all of us. But we need to be those, one of those who are not arrogant enough to think we've got all the answers, we've got it all sewn up. That as we go into the unknown, we go with the attitude of humility that says, we need to learn. You know what, things might have to be different. Kieran mentioned that a bit last Sunday, isn't he? We might have to step outside of our comfort zones and do things that we're not particularly comfortable with. But that might be what has to be going forward. We just don't know. What we do know is we follow the greatest. The greatest teacher. The greatest man. God's greatest gift. Last Sunday, we recognized that Jesus has a task for each and every one of us. He has appointed us to be his ambassadors, to be his representatives. But he wants to teach us what that looks like. He wants to teach us about himself. He wants to guide us on that journey to help us to be the best that we can be. Looking at his disciples, 
he said. Jesus wants to teach us. Jesus wants us to learn. The question for you, the question for me, as we go into the unknown, are we listening? Are we ready to learn? Have we switched on to the fact that we're going to have to learn? We're going to have to be listening to what God wants us to do. Nobody knows, nobody has the answers apart from God. So for you in your unknown, whatever that looks like, are you listening? Are you listening to what God is saying to you? How God is changing you, who wants to shape you, wants you to become different, the best you can be. Are you listening to him? Are you ready to learn more? We are lifelong learners. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you call us to follow you. You call us to be obedient. You call us to, to give ourselves to you, to, to, be in our, in, to follow Jesus' example of being obedient in all the details. You call us to be your ambassadors. Thank you that you also equip us with your spirit to give us confidence and boldness and, 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 and power and, and the answers and the words but you also want to teach us and guide us and shape us. Holy Spirit, would you do that work in us? I pray that for each and every one of us, as we have heard this, that we would tune into you, that we would not have that arrogance and that pride that thinks we have all the answers, that thinks we know best. Help us to be humble enough to accept you, that you know that we need to learn of you, we need to listen. So guide us, we pray. Help us as we go into the unknown, Lord. We're all different. <coughs> we all experience that in different ways. I pray that particularly for those who are struggling the most, you would draw near to them and be their comfort and strength at this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close by singing the song, Christ is my reward. It's a reminder that in the chorus of this, you know, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. As we step out into that known, picking that picture of the man walking, as we step out into the unknown, we don't know what's in front of us. But the option is not to go back. That's not an option. We want to keep going forward. Keep following. Keep learning. Keep trusting. Christ is my reward. <laughs>
service. Thank you for sharing this time with us. We pray God's blessing upon you and uh, if we can do anything to help, if we can pray with you over the phone or over a, a Zoom call or wherever it might be, please get in touch. We'd love the opportunity to talk to you and share with you. If you've got any questions about anything that's been said, if you don't agree with anything that's been said, again, get in touch. We'd love to have that dialogue with you. So please do join us. Next Sunday as we continue this, this series, um, may God bless you today. Let's share the words of the grace as we close. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Normally at this point on Father's Day we would have a gift for all the men. We didn't do that for the mothers this year and the, and the ladies. We did promise that we would do it when we get back together. I can make the same promise to you men that when we get back together there will be something for you as well. But God bless you. Whatever you're doing today, may you know his presence with you. And as we go into this unknown week, whatever that lies before us, let's go with the humility to know that he knows what's next. And we go with that ability and willingness to learn of him as he leads and guides us. God bless. Take care.